So um, I'd like to greet all the audience online and a special greetings to um, Professor uh, Temba Musia, our current interim vice chancellor and principal, a deputy vice chancellor of uh, research and postgraduate education, Professor Sunil Maharaj, our faculty of health sciences dean, Professor Tian Diaha, a deputy dean for teaching and, and learning, Professor Vanessa Stienkamp, deputy dean for, for um, stakeholder relations, Professor Flavia Senkubuke. Thank you very much. So I'll start my lecture now. I also want to greet our school chairs in the Faculty of Health Sciences, students and colleagues as well. So colleagues, my grandfather dared to dream that his grandchildren will one day be leaders in their fields. So despite him having no formal education uh, in, 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 in any way, he worked as a security officer in Johannesburg and he left his family in rural Limpopo where there was very little access to education. He made lots of sacrifices. He was a hustler. He hustled so my mother could go to a boarding school and also to teacher training college. And following that, he also secured that my mother has a nice starter home so I can have a soft life. And <laughs> so I, I dedicate this inaugural lecture to my grandfather, Frank Maluleke, and to all the people who made sure that his dream came true. My mother, Mshoti Mashamba, she was my role model. She prioritized my education she sent me to the best schools her money could buy. My late grandmother, Flora Maruleke, she raised me with love and taught me the essence of Ubuntu. My husband, Rowan Thompson, held my hand throughout my academic career. Uncle Jonas, Uncle William Chabalela, thank you for being my cheerleaders throughout. My Uncle George and Auntie Joyce Mashamba, who is late, and my father-in-law, Ian Thompson. Thank you for all your support in encouraging us to come back to South Africa and serve to advance the democracy that you fought so hard for. My inspiration, my children, Gabrielle, Mutloti, Frank, Thompson, you are my inspiration, and I strive every day to contribute to a better life for your generation and your, the generations to come. So. This includes ensuring that you have longevity and good health, and also through access to high quality healthcare services. I present to you today my contribution to democratizing healthcare access through my research in Ghana, South Africa, and Rwanda, as well as all over the world. The ultimate goal of the research that we've conducted with my team is to democratize healthcare access through the use of reassured diagnostics. Access to health care is paramount in our context, especially here in sub-Saharan Africa where the disease burden is so high. So, and access to high quality and timely diagnostic services is essential for strengthening our health systems. However, the diagnostic services have traditionally received limited attention in a global health compared to the drug discovery and vaccine development. So inadequate diagnostic systems um, and in inadequate access to quality diagnostics um, can really often lead to poor health outcomes. And uh, especially in our context where, you know, we have a, a poor access to laboratory infrastructure. Point of care diagnostics have emerged to be a promising health innovation that can address the challenges that I've just mentioned. Point of care diagnostics are near patient diagnostic devices that promise or provide rapid results to guide clinical de uh, decisions. So the World Health Organization has defined a criteria for point of care diagnostics that should be used in our context. And the criteria is the reassured criteria. The reassured criteria guide our research focus in the reassured 
Diagnostics Group at UP. And it's very much an acronym that stands for the real-time connectivity, ease of specimen collect collection, affordability, sensitivity and specificity, user-friendly, robust, and equipment-free, and as well as deliver, delivered to end users. So that's what the acronym stands for. Our research focus employs an implementation science approach to uh, assess whether the point of care diagnostics that are, are used in our primary health care context and at a community level, to assess whether these diagnostics meet the reassured criteria. So implementation science approach that we are using enables us to answer our research questions using a variety of methods from different disciplines, from public health, from social sciences, basic sciences, and clinical science. The interdisciplinary approach or the dis interdisciplinary nature of our, our research promotes the systemic uptake of research findings into routine practice, ensuring equitable access to high quality diagnostic services and strengthening health systems. So the reassured criteria uh, requires that we, we, we ensure that our diagnostics are um, you know, uh, they, they, easily connected. So they, they, it states that tests must be connected to health data platforms and in, to enable uh, re, uh, users to read the test results in order to provide the required data for clinical decisions uh, and, and also for, to, to make sure that the, the data inform disease surveillance. So a combination of high quality point of care diagnostics devices with mobile health technologies offers the novel ways of diagnosing and tracking infectious diseases and to, to also improve the infectious di disease surveillance. Our nature review from, uh, um, that we, we, we published right before the, the COVID-19 pandemic really guided some of the strategies that were used during the pandemic. It really presented um, some of the guidance that uh, you know, the resource limited settings used for you know, outbreak response uh, as well as to implement different strategies for point of care diagnostics. The reassured criteria also means that uh, there should be ease of sample collection. So we have um, contributed to this criteria by mapping uh, research that exists around this. And this is the work we've done recently with the reassured group in UP. So we tried to contribute to this criteria by conducting a scoping review to systematically map the evidence um, of self-sampling to help diagnose sexual transmitted diseases, the STIs. Diagnosing STIs requires in, 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 in current state or in, a, in our primary health care now, it requires physical examination of people who present to the clinic with symptoms. Uh, this practice often seems as in very invasive and very unattractive to many people. And this is due to the social stigma associated to STIs. Delayed diagnostics and treatment of STIs often increase the risk of STI, STI and long-term, which can really lead um, uh, to uh, you know, long-term uh, implications, health implications, including chronic pelvic pain and uh, fertility issues. Cervical cancer as well can develop through that. So through self-sampling, people can collect their own samples either at the healthcare facility or at home, or in relatively, uh, in, in, in a private uh, or in privacy. This allows people to self-sample at their own convenience, uh, you know, ultimately various barriers of, of, uh, of accessing testing can now be, be prevented to ensure that we, we address the, the, their health needs. The reassured criteria states that the tests should be affordable and they have to be affordable to end users as well as our health systems. So affordable point of care diagnostics uh, to end users and health systems is really paramount. 
And globally, vulnerable people are faced with healthcare challenges such as limited access to diagnostics and they have poorer health outcomes. These challenges are more pronounced among vulnerable populations from low and middle income countries where we are and um, where our health systems are fraught with uh, inadequacies and lack of resources. During early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, we observed financial challenges that were faced by our health systems in our context here. We, the, our health systems were under pressure uh, to meet the needs uh, of our communities, especially in terms of access to testing. Private, the private um, sector played a crucial role in, in increasing the capacity for, for testing in, in terms of COVID-19. We conducted a study with our global partners, and in this study was really to map the availability and affordability of point-of-care diagnostics in the private sector. And so this is because we've seen the, you know, the large contribution of the private sector to help provide uh, the, the, the contribute to, to the pandemic in terms of providing the test. The WHO also recommended that we adopt the whole of society approach in responding to COVID-19. And they also advised that we engage the private sector in, in terms of COVID-19 testing and, and to, to help build the surge capacity. We conducted this multi-country study, as I said, to investigate the availability and affordability of the tests um, in, in only in the private sector and invited the contribution of um, contributions from countries in um, 22 countries in the low and middle income countries, and this included South Africa. And we only focused on countries where the large proportion of patients seek care in private sector. The results of our survey really highlighted that the engagement of private sector in the SARS-CoV-2 testing was not uniform in, in all the sampled countries, and there remains lots of weaknesses. So they, this also really showed us that there's a need for public-private partnership in terms of you know, provision of, of, of testing services in our context. The WHO also urges us to avoid false positives and false negatives uh, by optimizing sensitivity and specificity while implementing point of care diagnostics. To contribute to this criterion, we conducted two studies. And the first study was conducted in South Africa. And this study was guided by our earlier um, Re uh, research that we conducted in the whole province of KwaZulu-Natal. With the study that we conducted in, in KwaZulu-Natal, we actually looked at 100 primary healthcare clinics in rural KZN and assessed the accessibility and availability of point of care diagnostics. And this was done in 20, 20, 2015. The results of this survey showed us that HIV point of care testing was the most uniformly or most available test in all the rural clinics. However, we argued that having access to, to testing or any type of test doesn't guarantee the quality of, of the results or even quality of healthcare. And also does not, does not really um, uh, prove that uh, it, or guarantee improved health outcomes. So, We've looked at the South African guidelines that recommended that um, you know, the clinics should use two tests uh, to test algorithm for HIV testing. And we looked at whether there is any evidence of the accuracy of this algorithm. And there was no such evidence at the time. We never proposed to conduct a field evaluation study to assess the accuracy and compliance of this HIV rapid test algorithm, the compliance to um, HIV, uh, WHO HIV standards. And uh, we looked at clinics that are in all the, the KwaZulu-Natal provinces, 11 provinces. We observed this accuracy of HIV rapid test algorithm for 208 consenting antenatal 
patients that were accessing voluntary HIV testing services in nine primary health care clinics in 11 KwaZulu-Natal pro provinces. So the testing algorithm that was used at the time was the advanced quality test and the one-step anti-HIV test and the ABON HIV tri-line test. So we collected venous blood samples also in order to, to conduct the, 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 the ELISA test as that was the test that was used as gold standard at the time. So we recorded uh, the time to received of, received of result because that's also is of importance. It, so the test could be a rapid test, but then if it takes too long for you to re receive the result, that could be a problem. It's no longer now meeting the standards. So among the tested women, to which were 208 women, uh, the mean age of those women were 20, was 26. And out of the 72 women, um, so, uh, the, the, the age was 20, 26. The, the 72 women of, uh, from the nine, nine clinics were identified as HIV positive. We, we assessed the accuracy of the test in, in comparison with the gold standard, and it was shown that the quality of the HIV testing test in the clinics was relatively uh, acceptable in comparison with the gold standard. So during this study, we observed that there were other blind spots, such as blind spots such as stock out of tests. And this is what res has resulted in, that in, in a poor availability of the test in most of the clinics. And we then, uh, five days la later, we also saw that um, there is an advancement in the, you know, in the type of tests that were available at point of care. We saw an increase in accessibility and use of mobile linked point of care tests, particularly in uh, settings that had um, low, uh, limited access to laboratory infrastructure. So we also seen that this was also highly, uh, you know, used. The, the mobile linked tests were highly used uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So as a follow-up to our KwaZulu-Natal study, we conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis to really look at the global you know, accuracy, uh, accuracy at the global level of uh, point-of-care tests that are linked to, to, to mobile devices. So our systematic review and meta-analysis analysis were, was guided by the PRISMA um, and then it included studies from all over the world and the studies that presented evidence on mobile health linked diagnostics. And uh, we, our focus, although we mapped studies from the global, uh, from globally, we were focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa. We wanted to see what's going on actually in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. We found 11 eligible studies in our systematic review and the evidence that we evaluated showed us that most of the evidence that exist, existed at the time was, was of point of care diagnostics that was focused on the following diseases. It was focused, the, most of the mobile linked point of care diagnostics that we found in the evidence for Sub-Saharan Africa were focused on malaria infections and schistostomiasis. And this was a surprise to us because we, we were really expecting to see more studies focusing on HIV testing, being mobile linked uh, tests, and TB as well as COVID. And this wasn't the case. The evidence showed us something different. So basically, there is really a lot more uh, this advancement in a, there is also a change in the focus of, uh, you know, for point of care diagnostics. So the more advanced tests are not really specifically for, for HIV tests or, or TB. So that shows also a gap maybe in, uh, in production for, for these types of tests because we still have these pandemics with us. They, they have not gone away. So we recommend an increased effort in supporting field evaluation for mobile linked um, diagnostics as well as uh, really not only field evaluation, the development of these diagnostics in our context so we can increase the availability. 
So further on, the, the, the WHO wants us to ensure that the tests that we develop and, and deploy in this context are user-friendly. So testing procedures that uh, we're using for a point-of-care test must be sim simple and must be performed in few steps. So it mustn't be too complex and require qualification for people to perform point-of-care tests. So, you know, to contribute to this criterion, we conducted a study in Rwanda, and uh, this study was really focused on uh, HIV, two studies actually, focused on HIV self-testing, and this is because Rwanda was really prioritizing the HIV self-testing. So Rwanda officially introduced HIV self-testing -test uh, on their on World AIDS, AIDS Day in 2017 to help increase the uptake of HIV self-testing by underserved population. And this really, the focus was mainly on men. So uh, HIV self-testing guidelines were included in their national HIV preven prevention and management guide guidelines in 2018. This is for, for Rwanda. So the, we also looked at other studies that are, were conducted around Rwanda, um, in Rwanda, the country, and around this topic. And it was shown that, you know, um, that there a lot of the there are lots of qualitative studies that were being conducted on acceptability of HIV uh, self-testing for men. And however, none of the studies explored strategies to help improve the uptake of, of HIV self-testing. Or and it was also shown in those previous studies that there's limited knowledge of the HIV self-testing. And you know, so there's likely to be limited uptake if the knowledge is low. So we saw this as an opportunity to develop a tailored HIV self-testing health education intervention to help improve the HIV self-testing uptake by men in Rwanda. So we sought to develop this program uh, with, in collaboration with the key stakeholders in Rwanda. And the key stakeholders included men in Rwanda and specifically in Kigali, the, the city in Rwanda. We also um, invited uh, other stakeholders who are people who are really working closely to developing the <coughs> the guidelines for HIV self-testing and also the users for HIV self-testing and the healthcare workers in, 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 in Rwanda. So we employed a nominal group technique to conduct a high-level structured workshop for, to, to, in order for us to co-create the program with the key stakeholders. And with, after conducting this program, we, we piloted the program in the field in the field within Kigali. And you'll be surprised to hear that we had like almost 100% response rate. And um, I'll talk more about that in, on another platform. And this was one of our surprises, but for people in Rwanda, that wasn't a surprise because people are very compliant in Rwanda. So <laughs> the, the pilot study really has not only proven that uh, our, the, the program was feasible, um, to, to be, you know, uh, scaled up in Rwanda. The pilot study also showed us, helped us learn about the community there in Rwanda and, and the, you know, the, the level of discipline of the people in Rwanda. So the, our pilot study has proven that it will be feasible to implement a HIV self-testing health education program. And, and that is, you know, it's really tailored for men uh, in, in Rwanda and that, you know, we we should really be able now to scale it up and assess, assess the effect, effectiveness of this program uh, in a larger population in Rwanda and other similar settings. And, and I also wanted to say the similar setting would clearly not be South Africa. It's not similar to Rwanda. So the WHO also wants our diagnostics that are used at point of care to be rapid and robust. And we've seen the rapid and robustness um, of point of care diagnostics 
during the pandemic response. And you've seen all the speedy Gonzales of, uh, of scientists running right to the front line to deliver the diagnostics hours there. So yeah, so they want us to make sure that the results are made available to ensure treatment of, of patient at first visit. They want the tests to meet the quality standards. They want the tests to, you know, to, to be easily accessible. That, so the test must survive the supply chain uh, without requiring any transport and storage conditions such as, such as refrigerators. So they really want the tests to be robust. How to achieve this? We, we, we don't know, we just go out and conduct studies to figure out and find out how this can be done. So in response to, to this, we, we conducted um, an audit. Um, uh, this is an audit before COVID-19. Although I'll share with you the, the audit that we conducted after COVID-19. Before COVID-19, we conducted um, an audit of a quality management system for HIV rapid tests in KwaZulu-Natal. And this audit revealed the need to improve staff compliant to quality standards, including supply chain management. So we, we really uh, followed it up by co-creating and designing a pilot mobile learning um, curriculum for healthcare workers. The, the curriculum was more focused on, on uh, optimizing or improving the knowledge of quality standards and not specifically on a one specific standard. So we designed um, this, um, this curriculum uh, really to improve the quality, specifically in rural KwaZulu-Natal, because that's the study setting that we used. We chose MOVA by learning as um, the most appropriate delivery approach for this curriculum uh, because it was shown in literature that this approach is most effective for improving access to education, specifically to people in remote areas. So the study that we conducted, it was uh, for delivering this curriculum, was conducted during the COVID-19 pandemic and during the hard lockdown in the middle of 2020. <laughs> and during this period, most non-COVID-19 research was not permitted. So although our study didn't exclusively focus on COVID-19, we were granted permission to continue with our intervention because um, it was said that the intervention is likely to improve the implementation or uptake or quality uh, of uh, COVID-19 testing because at that time there were still plans to deploy the COVID-19 tests at point of care. So this health promotion intervention that we conducted during the pandemic uh, was really informed by um, stakeholder generated ideas. Um, so we, we, we designed we, the, this really and, and with, the, with stakeholders involved and piloted it uh, with, uh, with the users of diagnostics in the clinics. So we, we used nominal group technique uh, to enable collabor collaboration with key stakeholders in designing the pilot uh, uh, intervention uh, or the pilot intervention or I mean, I mean the curriculum. So um, the stakeholders were selected from all 11 KZN district to participate in this uh, uh, in, in, in co-creation and all the 11 districts were also involved in, a, in the pilot studies in the, the one pilot study. So we, we, we um, made sure that um, also, we, in, we collaborate with the experts in education. So we collaborated with Stadio Group, that it's, it's, a, it's a teacher training uh, education uh, institution that helped us with designing the curriculum. So we used Moodle as our online learning management system for the curriculum. Uh, guided by that nominal group uh, technique results, we we had five delivery modes for the curriculum. So the five delivery modes were also used in delivering the, the, the curriculum in model. So the course content cons consisted of three teaching units, activities, online quizzes, and online um, 
service. So um, the curriculum was really well received by the healthcare workers. And one of the biggest problem was um, with that um, some of the healthcare workers had a problem with the, you know, accessing um, internet and, uh, and, and all of that. During the pandemic also there were like complications with healthcare workers being getting ill and that, that was uh, one of the biggest problem. So despite all that, the poor network coverage and limited access to mobile technology, COVID-19 restrictions as well, our, our intervention was well received and uh, in all participating clinics. So uh, after observing the increase now in, uh, in, in, in the in acceptability, we actually um, published uh, the, the intervention and some of the developers of diagnostics are really keen to use that curriculum for, you know, and, and, and as part of, of what they offer with, with the diagnostics in the clinics. So following the study in a in, in KwaZulu Natal and observing the increased availability and use of diagnostics during the COVID-19 pandemic in 2021. Um, and also we noticed that to access to diagnostics, those pandemic, the pandemic diagnostics, COVID-19 pan, uh, pandemic diagnostics was not uniform also. So we, we, we that is something just we just observe, observed. But observing that we also noticed that, you know, the, um, We've been conducting a lot of our studies in one province, KZN, and it was getting too much attention, and not any other province. And this was not, uh, all, no, no longer feasible also for me because I was now in the north, moved to University of Pretoria. So my move to University of Pretoria, it means my focus also now changed the province of focus now became Limpopo. So we conducted a supply chain management study. So we evaluated the supply chain management of uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, tests. And this, we focused on a district of Lim um, Mopani in Limpopo. And this is one of the districts that was mostly affected by the pandemic. And most of the mortalities were reported in Mopani district. So we purposely sampled 47 clinics in, in Mopani district between June and September 2022. So one of the participants, uh, we, we, we had one participant per clinic to help us with the audit uh, of, of each of those clinics. So we were guided with this audit, we were guided by the WHO management science and health guidelines tool for to, to develop our own audit tool. And this is not ideal because it's not really uh, focused on our context. It's a global tool. So we tried our level best to adapt the tool to suit our context. So the, the audit tool really focused on looking at criteria such as selection, quality, storage, procurement, the quality insurance distribution, and inventory management, human resource capacity of a point of care diagnostics for COVID-19. And we found that, you know, the clinics in, in Mopani, they tried their level best to comply, but the resources that they had were not suitable to enable them to even be compliant in terms of the criteria that the WHO want us to meet. So this also is an opportunity for us to develop supply chain management systems that are suitable for our context. Um, we also notice this again, WHO wants us to ensure that this, the equipment that we develop for point of care diagnostics are equipment free and simple. It's tough. So, <laughs> so how do we, you know, they, I want, they're saying ideally the test should not require any special equipment, should be operating using very simple devices, use solar um, or battery, not be connect, shouldn't be connected on to, to electricity because of load shedding. <laughs> the completed test should be easy to dispose and ma manufactured by recyc recyclable material. So this criteria is quite tight 
quite tough. And, um, but what we're no noticing is that this is also one of the biggest blind spots in point of care develop, diagnostics development and, and, and implementation. There's still quite a lot of plastics that are being used and uh, the developers are finding it hard to find uh, materials that can help them really meet this criteria. So we recently started working very closely with bioengineers that are developing and manufacturing diagnostics uh, targeted at sub-Saharan Africa or targeted at some limited settings. And um, two of the recent conferences that I was invited to speak to were just for bioengineers. I even asked myself, why are you even inviting me here? But they wanted to know what's happening in the field so it can guide their development of diagnostics. So, um, yeah, so why are we, we collaborating also with the, with the Abbott, um, Abbott Diagnostics? I've noticed that they are reaching out more to us, the researchers, to collaborate with them right at early stages of development of these diagnostics, not at the end, not during de deployment or at the time that they want to evaluate and do the field evaluation. They invite us as they are still on a drawing board to know, to get us involved on making sure that the criteria is met and then that the specimens are meeting the, the criteria of the WHO. WHO also want these diagnostics de 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 delivered to end users, and they're saying the test must be made accessible to those who need them the most. So this means we need to address those supply chain challenges that I've just shared that we are still um, uh, experiencing. So we've conducted quite a few studies around this area of supply chain management, because it remains a blind spot. We conducted studies in Ghana, and some in South Africa that is still ongoing. So the results here, it still shows that um, stock out of the test is still a uh, biggest problem. So as much as the test could be, you know, um, as accurate as possible, if you don't have enough of a test and you don't have systems to ensure supply chain management or sustainable availability of the test, it's really not, we're still not meeting the WHO standard and not delivering what's required. So, our research really emphasizes the need for equitable access to quality diagnostics and leaving no one behind. So the research on performance of diagnostics really fo is focusing mainly on accuracy. It's really evident. So we're doing very well with that. So there is still quite a lot of blind spots that are not being looked at. We look a lot at, at, at accuracy, but not on many other things. So our previous and ongoing study, uh, studies on, and research revealed that the reassured diagnostics uh, research blind spots um, are, are really too many. And we need to focus mainly on these blind spots and also even study them and continue uh, addressing the gaps. We, ha we have identified that there is limited focus on sustainability of the diagnostics tests that are deployed in our context and also limited focus on local infrastructure capa capa cap capability uh, for sustaining the delivered test to in our contest. So we recommend an increased um, investment on, res on, on, you know, on, on local development of the diagnostics, as well as more research on assessing, assessing the, the, those diagnostics while they are being employed in our context. And also the focus on ensuring that the diagnostics meet the reassured criteria as they are being delivered in our context. So I want to thank all the people who contributed in this. So the contributors of this research that I've just presented, uh, you know, uh, in the UKZN, because uh, that's where I was leading the group, and some of them have moved with me here to UP, so it, the contributors are at UKZN and UP. We also conducted this research with our partners in the University of Washington and University College London, McMaster University, McGill University, and Imperial College London. So future plans for our research. We still plan to do a lot, especially under the reassured criteria at University of Pretoria. 
or the Reassured Diagnostics Research Group at the University of Pretoria. So future plans for this group involves transdisciplinary multi-country studies in collaboration with other diagnostics researchers locally and globally. We are now at early stages of a project that is aimed at advancing local development of microfluidics diagnostics for both human and animal. So we're looking at diagnostics from human and animals with colleagues in Stockholm University and Mount Kenya University, as well as the colleagues at Veterinary Sciences, because they're helping us focus, uh, bring our bring us closely to focusing on the One Health component, because as you can see, WHO wants us to also look at the, you know, environmentally friendly diagnostics. Um, we're also um, working on very closely, as you notice the criteria for, um, for WHO want the diagnostics to be user-friendly, sample, sample collection to be easy as well. So we're very, working very closely with um, Ashley Tabet at uh, Washington University to develop technology for self-sampling, specifically for children under five, and also for people who really can't take needles or don't want to see, uh, you know, blood. We also have worked, um, you, you know, work that we are planning right now or at early stages of the work on advancing uh, diagnostics or point of care diagnostics for precision me medis medicine with a focus on uh, nuclear medicine and TB. And we're also working with a team at Edinburgh University, uh, Professor Mutapi, uh, on the creation of a WHO collaboration, uh, collaborating platform for point of care diagnostics in Sub-Saharan Africa. We also plan a multi-country study with Abbott. This is for HCV, HCV point of care diagnostics. And this study is really also focused mainly on uh, performance of the diagnostics, but we know we will, fo we will follow it up with looking, and looking at all the criteria for the uh, reassured, uh, for the reassured as, as stipulated by WHO. Again, I would like to acknowledge all the funders who made this research possible. Research is not free, and it's a lot of money that's required. So I'm acknowledging all the funders who made this possible and uh, who provided us with grants and scholarships. I, I have too many people to thank, so I just didn't get here by myself. All my co colleagues at UKZN and UP who were there in my time of need, I would like to acknowledge all my supervisors and mentors and enablers who made a significant contribution to my academic growth. My master supervisor, uh, Prof. Solomon, uh, who opened the academic doors for me and taught me the art of scientific writing and publishing in high impact journals. Musa Mashavela, Prof. Musa Mashavela, who welcomed me to pro public health and exposed me to evidence synthesis research. Prof. Ben Sartorius, uh, for agreeing to serve as my local supervisor when Paul Drain was based in Harvard uh, as my main supervisor. Uh, to my exceptional PhD supervisor, Paul Drain, Professor Paul Drain, uh, who shared his expertise, knowledge of point of care diagnostics, even shared his NIH money with me, and made time to travel to South Africa to meet with me quarterly, one-on-one. -on -one. So, and Professor, um, Sloto uh, and Professor Ngamo provided an enabling environment for me to have, a, you know, a rich career growth as a junior academic at UKZN. I really, uh, you know, appreciate all the work they've done with, with my growth. And I, I was actually enabled by them to really progress into a leadership, to lead a mega, mega school, a school of health systems and uh, healthcare and school of nursing and public health at UKZN uh, as an academic leader for research just soon after completing my PhD, and they enabled me. My uh, vice chancellor, Professor Tawana Kupe, and your team at University of Pretoria, I thank you for welcoming me to University of Pretoria and for having the courage to trust me to lead a very big faculty <laughs> as a research leader for the faculty. And, um, I know it wasn't easy for you to, to, to have me in that position, but uh, you had the courage to do so, and I won't let you down. 
Thank you for making UP a desirable university for me, Professor Kupi. So I also want to share, thank all my, you know, all my, my mentors that I have not mentioned by name, and especially um, Professor, Tawan, um, Professor Tabane in, uh, in McMaster University. Thank you for being a dedicated mentor. Uh, I, I, you know, I have a new perspective to, to, to academic leadership, and uh, this is because of all your guidance. And I, I've been able to lead in complex environments because of, you know, all his, he, he was always there on the other side of the phone, and I'm gonna WhatsApp him soon after this. So, um, thank you. <laughs> and I also want to thank my colleagues at the Faculty of Health Sciences, the executive team, Flavia, hello, and I also want to, <laughs> Hi, and also, you know, I really want to thank mostly Gertrude Mamabulo for enabling my leadership. Thank you, Gertrude. Thank you for all your support. Thanks to, to, to Jackie as well. And thank you very much, my Dean Professor Diaha, for always skipping your lunch. <laughs> He always welcomes my disturbance during his lunch breaks when I have to share something that can't wait. Must be shared now. Thanks for all that being so patient and, and, and very welcoming, especially when I need the selfies. We need more selfies after this. So, and thanks also to my peer mentors. I also want to say to them, today is officially my graduation from the early and mid-career academics peer mentorship pl platform. <laughs> so, Tembele Thethungwane, Kumbulan, and Temba, and Tulu Fellow, thank you very much for all your support for enabling me as my peer mentors. I get today is by, but I hope also is an opportunity to establish a senior academics peer mentorship platform. So, it really, really, really takes a village, colleagues, takes a village to produce a professor at University of Pretoria. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time and for taking time out of your busy schedules to come here and attend my inaugural lecture in person. And thank you to audience online. And you've been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you.